In this video, we're going to learn how to solve exponential and logarithmic equations. Although the overarching theme of college algebra is functions, for each type of function we've looked at prior to this, we either discussed how to solve related equations or you were already equipped to do so with what you learned in previous classes. So we've solved absolute value, radical, polynomial, and rational equations in different contexts. However, exponential and logarithmic expressions are new to us, so we want to spend some time discussing the different types of equations that contain them and how to solve in each situation. We have two major categories, equations with exponentials and equations with logarithms, and lucky for us we're not going to combine them. And within each of these categories we classify equations one of two ways. We're going to cover a couple examples of each type of equation so that you are well equipped to handle most any problem. We're going to start with exponential equations. In our most basic case, if possible, we write each exponential expression in terms of the same base. So in other words, on each side of the equation, we try to write an exponential expression that's written in terms of the same base. So we know that if a to the x is equal to a to the y, then if all other things are the same in our equation, then x and y have to be equal. So remember, when an exponential, typically our variable is in the exponent. The exponent is trying, what we're trying to isolate and solve for. So in this case, if we can write both sides of the equation in terms of the same base, then we can just set our exponents equal and we can solve for our variable. So let's try a couple examples of equations in this form. So we want to solve each equation for the variable. Our first equation is 3 to the 2x minus 6 is equal to 81. And of course, x is our variable. It's what we're trying to solve for. So my goal at this point is to write both sides of the equation in terms of the same base. Well, the left-hand side of the equation is already exponential. It's written with a base of 3. So if I can write 81 in terms of a base of 3, then I'm golden. So 81, it turns out, is 3 to the fourth power. So I can rewrite that 81 as 3 to the fourth power. Now I have an equation in which both sides are exponential expressions with the same base. So if everything else in this equation has to be equal and the bases are equal, then we know the exponents have to be equal as well. So I can essentially drop off the bases and just set the exponents equal and then solve for x. This is just a basic linear equation. Move your 6 over, so we have 2x is equal to 10. Divide by 2 and we have x is equal to 5. So our solution for this equation is x equals 5. Ideally, you should check your solutions, but we're not going to have any extraneous solutions here. Anything we find in an algebraically correct way is going to be a solution to our equation. Let's try another one. So 25 to the 4 minus x power is equal to 1 fifth to the 3x plus 1 power. So we have two exponentials in this case, but neither of them is in terms of the same base. So maybe we could write 25 in terms of 1 fifth, or maybe we could write 1 fifth in terms of 25. However, we have another option as well. If we can take each of these exponentials and write them in terms of a common base, then we can use that as well. So one thing that I noticed that 25 and 1 fifth have in common is 5. 25 is 5 squared, and 1 fifth is 5 to the negative 1 power. So this is going to be a good option. If we can rewrite 25 in terms of 5 and rewrite 1 fifth in terms of 5, then we'll have everything in terms of the same base. But notice in this case, it's neither of the bases that we started with. It's an entirely separate base. That's OK. As long as we can write everything in terms of the same base, it doesn't matter whether we're introducing a new one or if it's one we started with. So 25 is going to be rewritten as 5 squared, and 1 fifth is going to be rewritten as 5 to the negative 1 power. So notice I put parentheses around what I substituted in. That's because the current exponent, the one we already had, is being applied to the new exponent that we're adding into our equation as well. So we have to take that into account. So what we have on each side of our equation is now a power to a power. And as we've discussed before, the rule when we take an exponent and apply another exponent to it is we multiply the exponents together. So everything is in terms of the same base, and we know all other things considered, the exponents have to be equal to one another. In this case, because we have exponents that are raised to other exponents, each exponent on each side of the equation is multiplied together. So our new equation is 2 times 4 minus x is equal to negative 1 times 3x plus 1. I drop off my bases, and I recognize power to a power means multiply. So this is my new equation. 
So first thing I need to do is distribute on each side. So we have 8 minus 2x is equal to negative 3x minus 1. Now my goal is to solve for x, but I've got x's on both sides of the equation. That's okay, that just means I need to move all the x's to one side and I need to move all the constants to the other side. In this case, I'm going to choose to add the 3x, that way the x's become positive. So I add the 3x to both sides, I now have 8 plus x is equal to negative 1, and then I move my 8 over to the other side as well. So I'm left with x is equal to negative 9, and that's my final answer for this problem. So these two examples really represent our ideal situation. If we can write everything on each side of the equation in terms of the same base, then the fact that the equations are exponential doesn't really matter. We essentially just drop off the bases, set the exponents equal, and we typically have a really simple equation that we can solve using basic algebra. However, what happens when we can't express exponentials in terms of the same base? In this case, we use the inverse of an exponential, which is a logarithm, and we use the logarithm properties to solve our equation. So remember, anytime we're trying to solve an equation in algebra, we use inverses all the time. If we want to get rid of addition, we use subtraction. If we want to get rid of multiplication, we use division. Well, if we want to get rid of an exponential, we use a logarithm. Logarithms and exponentials are inverses of one another, and so they behave in such a way that they can cancel each other out, which is what we want in this situation. What's different here, however, is normally we would require the same base. So if we want to get rid of an exponential with a base of 3, we'd need a logarithm base 3 to cancel it out. Well, it turns out in this situation we don't actually care so much about what the base of the logarithm is. What we really care about is the power rule, so let me show you how this works. So say we have a really basic exponential equation, a to the x power is equal to b, and we want to solve for x. So we're supposing that b can't be written in terms of a, a and b don't have anything in common, so we're going to resort to using a logarithm to solve this equation. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a logarithm to both sides of the equation. I'm going to recommend you either choose log, in other words log base 10, or natural log because we have buttons on the calculator for those. So if the option is to approximate our answer at the end, it's helpful if we're already in terms of either log or natural log. So I'm going to use natural log here. Remember, I can do anything to any equation that I want, pretty much, as long as I do it to both sides. So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides of the, this equation. So I now have natural log of a to the x power is equal to natural log of b. Here's why it doesn't matter what type of logarithm I use. If you remember, when we talked about logarithmic properties, the power rule for logarithms said that if we have an exponent inside of a logarithm, we can take that exponent and pull it out front and multiply it by the logarithm. In other words, we make it a factor as opposed to leaving it as an exponent. And that rule wasn't dependent upon what type of logarithm we had. It applied regardless of the type of logarithm. So even though natural log and A are probably not related, and they don't necessarily individually cancel each other out, that power rule is still useful here. So X is what we're trying to solve for, and the power rule tells us we can take x out front, and then it's outside of the logarithm. At this point, natural log of a is just going to be a number. a is a constant number, so natural log of a is a constant number. So once we get to this point, all we have to do to solve for x is divide by natural log of a, move it to the other side, and then we have x by itself. So let's try a few examples that fall under this case. So we want to solve each equation, and we want both the exact answer, in other words, the answer that has logarithms, no rounding, and we also want an approximation to three decimal places. So since we're going to need to approximate and use a calculator, ideally we either need to use common log, log base 10, or we need to use natural log in order to solve our equations. So let's start with 7 to the x power is equal to 60. So best case, I can write 60 as a power of 7, or I can write them each in terms of the same base. Well, that doesn't really look like an option here. 7 and 60 don't really have anything in common, so that's not going to be a good option for us. So instead, we're going to use the logarithm. In this case, I'm going to choose to use natural logarithm, but you can use log base 10 if you want. And I'm going to use the properties of logarithms to solve this equation. 
So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides of this equation. So I now have natural log of 7 to the x power is equal to natural log of 60. Then I'm going to use that power rule for logarithms that says that if I have an exponent inside of my logarithm, I can pull it out front and multiply it by the logarithm. So if I pull the exponent out of the logarithm, I now have x times the natural log of 7 is equal to the natural log of 60. So keep in mind, again, natural log of 7 is just a number. It's not pretty, but think of it kind of like a square root of 7. If you see a square root of 7, you don't necessarily do anything with it, but you can manipulate it just as you manipulate, manipulate excuse me, any other constant number. So if I want to get x by itself, all I need to do is divide out natural log of 7. So my exact answer is x is equal to the natural log of 60 divided by the natural log of 7. This is my exact answer. This is as precise as it gets. We also want an approximation, which means we're going to plug this expression into the calculator, and we want it approximated to three decimal places. So if you plug this into your calculators, you should get approximately 2.104. That is roughly what x is equal to in this situation. Let's try another one. We have 1024 is equal to 19 to the x power plus 4. Okay, so we don't have just one expression on each side. Notice in this case we have the 4 added on. So in terms of writing things in terms of the same base, we don't have that option at this moment because the exponential is not isolated. So first thing we need to do is we need to get that 19 to the x power by itself. So first step, I'm going to move over the 4. I'm going to subtract it from both sides. So I now have 1020 is equal to 19 to the x power. So this is the point when I say, OK, can I write 1020 as a power of 19? Or can I maybe write them both in terms of some other base? It doesn't look like that's going to happen here either. So now I'm going to use the logarithm. And I'm going to use the natural log again. So I take the natural log of both sides of the equation. I use my power rule on the right hand side to bring down the exponent. So I now have natural log of 1020 is equal to x times the natural log of 19. I want to get x by itself, so I divide by the natural log of 19, and x is exactly equal to natural log of 1020 divided by natural log of 19. And if we plug this into a calculator, we get approximately 2.353. Now let's try another example like this. So notice that in both of these examples, we only had one exponential, which meant we only had one variable. Well, what happens if we have more than one exponential, which means we have more than one exponent that has a variable? How's that going to change the problem? Well, let's see. So here's our next example. We have 4 to the 2x minus 7 is equal to 5 to the 3x plus 1. So we have two exponential expressions in this case, and we're trying to solve for x. So 4 can't be written in terms of 5, 5 can't be written in terms of 4, and we can't write both of them in terms of something else. So we need to use a logarithm. So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides of the equation, and then I'm going to apply that power rule twice. I have two logarithms, one on each side, so I'm going to apply the power rule to each side. So notice in this case, there's more to the exponent than just an x by itself. We have 2x minus 7 as one exponent, and 3x plus 1 as the other exponent. So I have to bring down that entire expression out front. So I bring down each of my exponents, and notice that I'm going to put parentheses around the exponent. When I bring it out front, it becomes a factor. In other words, it becomes something we're multiplying by the rest of the equation. Well, in this case, because there's more than one term that's being multiplied, I have to make sure I put parentheses around it so that everything that I brought down is multiplied by everything that was already in the equation. So when I bring down something that has more than one term, I put parentheses around it, which essentially means we're going to end up using the distributive property. Now, typically, we're used to seeing the distributive property written where the thing we're distributing is out front. Here, it's written so that the thing we're distributing, the natural log of 4 and the natural log of 5, are written at the end. So let's rearrange it so that the natural log of 4 and natural log of 5 are out front in the order we're more used to seeing. This is completely legal to do. 
Multiplication is what we call commutative in algebra. Commutative means we can rearrange things, we can multiply in any order that we want, and we'll still get the same answer. So this looks a little bit more like what we're used to seeing. Okay, so now natural log of 4, natural log of 5, those are just numbers. They're constant numbers. They can be distributed to this particular situation, and it's not going to change anything. It's completely legal to do that. So on the left-hand side, I distribute to the 2, and I distribute to the negative 7. So I have 2 times natural log of 4 times x minus 7 times natural log of 4, and I also have essentially the same thing on the right-hand side of the equation. So I specifically put parentheses around the 2 natural log of 4 and the 3 natural log of 5 to show that that's the entire coefficient for the x. We want to make sure we know that that's the constant part and it's being attached to the variable x, which is what we're trying to solve for. So I did that on both sides of the equation in this case. Okay, so as with any equation, the goal is to get the variable by itself. So we're trying to isolate x, trying to get it by itself. Well, what does that mean in this situation? Well, as with any equation, we combine like terms. So everything with an x is moved to one side. Everything that doesn't have an x is moved to the other side. It just looks a little different than what we're used to. We have a 2 natural log of 4 and a 3 natural log of 5 as our coefficients for x. But procedurally, nothing changes. So everything with an x, we're going to move to the left. Everything that doesn't have an x, we're going to move to the right. So we have to subtract the 3 natural log of 5 times x to move it to the left. And we have to add the 7 times the natural log of 4 to move it to the right. So when we rearrange, this is what we're left with. So notice that both terms on the left-hand side have an x. Both terms on the right-hand side don't have an x. So if we had nice, pretty coefficients, we would just combine our coefficients together. We'd have one term with an x in it. We just divide and solve. Unfortunately, 2 natural log of 4 and 3 natural log of 5 can't really be combined together in that same way. So our other option at this point is to factor out the x on the left as a greatest common factor. Notice both the first term and the second term have an x in common. That means we can factor it out and pull it out front and then we're just left with these natural logs on the end. So if we factor that out, x is by itself and it's multiplied by this expression with these natural logs. So 2 natural log of 4 minus 3 natural log of 5 is just a number. It's like saying the square root of 4 minus the square root of 5. We all know that's just a number. We just don't know exactly what it is. We write it in that specific form. We don't actually combine into one term. So this is essentially the same situation. So the only other step we need to do to get x by itself is we need to divide by that big natural log factor that we're multiplying by. So if we divide both sides by what's currently multiplied by the x, we get x is equal to the natural log of 5 plus 7 times the natural log of 4 divided by 2 times the natural log of 4 minus 3 times the natural log of 5. That is our exact answer. And that's as simple as it's going to get in this situation. So our only other step is we want to approximate this. You plug all of this into your calculator. Either you can approximate each natural log at individual intervals, or you can just plug all of this into your calculator in one step. Make sure you use parentheses around the numerator and denominator if you're going to do that. Regardless of how you do it, you should get approximately negative 5.503. That's roughly what our answer is equal to. Let's try one more exponential equation example. This is kind of a special case, so I want us to see one example of it, so at least if you run into it again, you know how to handle it. So here's our equation. We have e to the 2x plus 5e to the x minus 36 is equal to 0. Okay, so we have two exponential expressions in this equation, but the difference between this equation and what we've seen before is there's no way we can rearrange things so that there's one exponential expression on each side and that's it. Because of that subtracted 36, there's no way we can have just one exponential on each side. We're lucky because the exponentials have the same base, so in theory we might have been able to cancel, but once we have that additional constant term tacked onto the end, unfortunately it changes. So what's special about this equation in particular is that it's quadratic in form. 
It's not a quadratic. Remember, quadratic means the highest polynomial term is going to be x squared. This is not quadratic. It's not polynomial, but it's quadratic in form. In other words, if we analyze what this equation is saying a little bit more, then we may be able to rewrite it so that it looks like a quadratic. So what I'm noticing about this equation is my middle term is e to the x, and then my leading term, the term out front, it could be rewritten in terms of e to the x. So notice it's e to the 2x. Well, I know one of the rules for exponents states that if I have two exponents multiplied together, then that's the same thing as an exponent raised to another exponent. So in this case, my exponent is 2 times x. That could be rewritten as e to the x, then raised to the second power. So what we have in the middle is e to the x, and then what we have out front is essentially e to the x squared. So this is specifically what I'm talking about. We have e to the x squared, that's another way of saying e to the 2x, plus 5e e to the x minus 36 is equal to 0. So notice the basic structure of this situation is we have something in the middle. We have a particular structure, algebraic structure in the middle. Our first term is whatever that is, squared, and then our last term is a constant. So this looks a lot like, like a quadratic. It's something squared plus something involving that thing, for lack of a better way to put it, plus or minus some constant tacked onto the end. So if we didn't have the e to the x, if we just had a variable in its place, then this would be a quadratic. So our technique for solving something that looks like this is to make a temporary substitution to put in place of whatever is making this not quadratic. In this case, the e to the x is what's making this not actually quadratic. So we're going to put in a temporary substitution in place of the e to the x. You can use any variable you want except x, since we're already using x in the equation. So I've chosen a. So we're going to take this equation and we're going to rewrite it such that each e to the x is now written as an a. So this becomes a squared plus 5a minus 36 is equal to 0. And now this is an actual quadratic. a squared plus 5a minus 36 is an actual quadratic with the variable a. And we know exactly what to do with something like this. We can factor it if it factors. Or when in doubt, if it doesn't factor, we can use the quadratic formula and we can solve for a. In this case, this factors pretty easily. It's going to factor as a plus 9 times a minus 4. We set each of our factors equal to 0. So a plus 9 is equal to 0. a minus 4 is equal to 0. And if we solve for a, we get a is equal to negative 9 and a is equal to 4. Now, don't be misled into thinking that those are your final answers. Those are not your final answers. A is equal to, to negative 9 and A is equal to 4, but our original equation doesn't have any A's in it. It has X's. So at this point, we have to resubstitute. Wherever we had an A, we have to put back in an E to the X because that was what we originally substituted for. So I'm going to put an e to the x back in place of a, and then I'm going to continue the rest of the problem. Now, at this point, I have two separate small equations. So I'm solving these two individual equations for x. This also means that I may have more than one solution to this equation, which is completely fine. So let's start on the left-hand side. e to the x is equal to negative 9. I can't write negative 9 in terms of a base of e, so my best option is to use a logarithm. In this case, let's use the natural log. We know natural log and e are direct inverses of each other, so they should just immediately cancel. So natural log of e to the x is equal to natural log of negative 9. So on the left-hand side, you can think of it one of two ways. Either the x comes out front, and then natural log and e cancel, just leaving us with a 1. Or just remember that natural log is the same thing as log base e. So whenever we're taking a logarithm, with the same base and applying it to an exponential with the same base, the logarithm and the exponential cancel, just leaving us with the exponent. In either case, we get down to x is equal to natural log of negative 9. Well, we have a problem here. If you remember when we graphed natural log or graphed any logarithmic function, we had a restriction on the domain. In other words, the things we could plug into a logarithm. We can only plug positive numbers into a logarithm. So anything that's less than or equal to 0, if we try to plug it into a logarithm, we run into a problem. 
See if you can plug this into your calculator. Try taking the natural log of negative 9 and see what it tells you. I can guarantee you it's going to give you an error. That's because this is undefined. We can't take a logarithm of a negative number. So we didn't do anything wrong. All our algebra is correct, but this is undefined. This is not actually a solution to the equation. Algebraically it is, but practically speaking, natural log of negative 9 is undefined. So this is not actually a solution to our equation. But let's go check out the other one. Let's see what happens here. So same problem. We can't write 4 in terms of e, so we're just going to use the natural log on both sides. So natural log of e to the x is equal to natural log of 4. My natural log and my e cancel each other out, and I'm just left with x. So x is equal to the natural log of 4. Natural log of 4 is completely defined. We can take a logarithm of a positive number all day long, and it's completely defined. So this is actually a solution. And if we want an approximation, that's approximately 1.386. So in this situation, because we had something that was quadratic in form, we almost had two answers to our problem. One of our answers turned out to be undefined, while the other one was OK. But realistically speaking, we could have had two answers to this equation. So we've covered exponential equations. Now let's talk about logarithmic equations, so equations that have a logarithm contained inside of them. So one thing we need to keep in mind, what we just saw in the previous example, is that each logarithmic function has a restricted domain. The restricted domain for every logarithm is 0 to infinity. In other words, the only numbers we can plug into a logarithm that are going to give us a defined answer are positive numbers. If we plug in anything to a logarithm and we end up with an input for the logarithm that's negative, that's going to be undefined. So what that means for solving equations is that we have to check our solutions when we're solving a logarithmic equation. We have to make sure that the answers we get don't give us negative inputs into our logarithms if we plug them back into the original problem. So every time we find a solution in a logarithmic equation, we have to make sure that if we plug it back in, it's not giving us anything negative inside of a logarithm. We can't have a negative inside of a log. That's completely undefined. So our most basic case is when there are logarithms with the same base on each side of the equation, kind of like with our exponentials, when everything was in terms of the same base or when we could write it in terms of the same base. In this case, when the logarithms are the same base on either side of the equation and we can get a single logarithm on each side, we can just set the arguments equal. Remember, argument was just the fancy term for the input. So whatever we're applying to the log applying the logarithm to, excuse me, we can set those equal and we can solve for our variable. So let's do a couple examples like this. We want to solve each equation and we just want the exact solution. So our first equation is log base 2 of 3x minus 4 is equal to log base 2 of x plus 2. So notice in this case we have one logarithm on each side of the equation, and each logarithm is in terms of the same base. In this case, the base is 2. So if everything else in the equation is equal, both sides are equal, both bases are equal, we know the inputs have to be equal as well. So just like we essentially dropped off the exponentials, we can essentially drop off the logs in this case. So we're left with 3x minus 4 is equal to x plus 2. We need to combine like terms, so all the x's on one side, all the constants on the other side. So I'm going to move my x over with subtraction, and then I need to move my negative 4 over with addition. So I have 2x is equal to 6, which simplifies to x is equal to 3. I need to check my answer though. I have to make sure that if I plug this answer back into the original equation that I don't end up with any negative numbers inside of a logarithm. So I plug it into my first logarithm. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 minus 4 is 5. So this becomes log base 2 of 5. That is completely defined so that one checks out. Now we need to check the answer we found in the second logarithm. So log base 2 of 3 plus 2 is also log base 2 of 5, which is defined. Therefore, because both logarithms don't have a negative input when we plug our solution back in, this is a solution to our equation. Let's try another one. Same directions. We now have natural log of x minus 4 is equal to natural log of x plus 6 minus natural log of x. 
So I notice I have three logarithms in this problem. They all have the same base. Remember, natural log is a base of e, so that's a log base e. The only problem is if I look at the right-hand side, it's not a single logarithm. It's two logarithms subtracted from one another. But if you remember, there was a rule that allowed us to combine logarithms together when they're subtracted. It was called the quotient rule. So the quotient rule stated that if we have division inside of a logarithm, we can split it up into two separate logarithms that are subtracted. Well, we can also use that rule in the opposite direction. So if we have two logarithms that are subtracted, we can combine them back together, and inside the single logarithm is going to be a division. So if we use that quotient rule, we can simplify this to natural log of x minus 4 is equal to natural log of x plus 6 divided by x. So in this case, we now have one logarithm on each side. The bases are the same, so we can set the inputs equal and we can solve. Anytime we have a rational equation, we need to get rid of the denominator first. So first thing I want to do is I want to multiply both sides by x. On the left-hand side, I now need to distribute the x that I just multiplied. So I have x squared minus 4x is equal to x plus 6. This is quadratic. The highest exponent is a 2. As soon as I see any, any equation where I have an exponent higher than 1, I know I need to move everything to one side of the equation. So move over the x and move over the 6. And we have x squared minus 5x minus 6 is equal to 0. I can factor this. This factors as x minus 5 and x plus 1. And then I set each factor equal to 0 and I solve for x. So I get x equals 5 and x equals negative 1. In this situation, we found two solutions to our equation. That means we need to check both of these solutions. I'm going to check 5 first. So I'm going to take 5, and I'm going to plug it back into each of the logarithms in the original equation. Notice we're going to have to check this answer in three separate logarithms. That's correct. We have to check it in three separate logarithms. So I plug it into the first one. I get natural log of 1, which is OK. Plug it into the second one. I get natural log of 11. That's also OK. And then finally, just natural log of 5, not actually changing anything. That is also OK. So all three of these logarithms check out, which means x equals 5 is a solution to our equation. Now let's check negative 1. So plug it into our first logarithm. Negative 1 minus 4 is negative 5. That is not defined. We don't even have to check the other two. If it doesn't work in the first one, it doesn't work for the entire problem. So because our check failed, our second solution is extraneous. Algebraically, it is a solution, but if we plug it back in, it gives us an undefined value, so it's not a solution to our equation. Just as with exponentials, our simpler case for logarithmic equations is when we have one on each side of the equation. So if we have one exponential on each side or one logarithm on each side, we can essentially just drop off the bases and set the inputs equal, and it's typically just a linear or maybe a quadratic equation. Our more complicated case occurs when we only have one expression in the problem, so one exponential or one logarithm. So that's what we're going to talk about next, what happens when there's one logarithm. In this case, we want to isolate it. If it's not, not already by itself, we need to get it by itself. And then we're going to convert to an exponential equation, which is actually going to make our lives so much easier. It's not going to require us to do the extra work we did with exponentials. It's just going to clean up our equation, and it's going to restate the logarithm in a more sense-making way. So if we have log base a of x is equal to b, we've got one logarithm by itself, and we want to convert this to an exponential. Remember, our rule for converting from a logarithmic equation to an exponential equation is the base of the logarithm becomes the base of the exponential, and then the other two numbers switch places across the equal sign. So in exponential form, this equation would be a to the b power is equal to x. So a is a constant, b is a constant. So a to the b power is just going to be a constant number. There are no variables on that side. And then x is already by itself. So in this case, x is equal to a to the b power would be our solution. So let's try a couple like this. We want to solve, give an exact answer, and an approximation to three decimal places. 
So our first equation is 4 times the natural log of 2x minus 7 is equal to 8. So I only have one logarithm in this problem. There's not going to be any setting them equal and dropping off the logs. That's not an option. So I need to isolate this logarithm before I do anything else. I need to divide out the 4 out front. So I have natural log of 2x minus 7 is equal to 2. Now that our logarithm is by itself, I then convert this to an exponential equation. So remember, natural log is the same thing as log base e. So the base in this problem is an e. So the base of the logarithm becomes the base of the exponential, and then the other two components in the problem switch places. So if I convert this to exponential form, we have e squared is equal to 2x minus 7. Now we need to solve for x. So x is multiplied by 2, and we also subtract a 7. So I need to move the 7, and I need to move the 2. So if I do this, I'm left with x is equal to e squared plus 7 divided by 2, which, if we plug into the calculator, is approximately 7.195. Now, as with any logarithmic equation, we do need to check our answer. Typically, it's sufficient just to check an approximation. If the approximation plugs into the logarithm and doesn't give us anything negative, then we're good. So I'm going to check with 7.195 plugged into my natural log. So 2 times 7.195, well, that's a little bit more than 14. We subtract 7, so that's a little bit more than 7. Regardless, we don't care about specifically what the number is. All we care about is the fact that whatever is inside of this logarithm is greater than 0. It is greater than 0, which means it checks out, which means this is a valid solution to our problem. Let's try another one log, so log base 10, of x plus 47 is equal to 2.6. Okay, in this case, our logarithm is already isolated. So our logarithm has an understood base of 10. The base stays the base, and the other numbers switch places. So we're immediately converting to exponential form. So in exponential form, this becomes 10 to the 2.6 is equal to x plus 47. I can isolate my x in one step, move the 47 over, we get x is equal to 10 to the 2.6 power minus 47. And approximating this in a calculator, we get approximately 351.107. Let's check this one. We only have one logarithm to check, so we plug in our approximate solution, and we just want to make sure whatever's inside of the logarithm is greater than zero. In this case, we're taking a positive number, and we're adding on another positive number, so our input is definitely greater than zero. So it passes our check, which means this is a solution to our problem. Now let's try one final example. So we want to solve log base 2 of x is equal to 3 minus log base 2 of x minus 2. So I actually have two logarithms in this situation. But unfortunately, this is not a case one equation because we also have the three. So this is kind of like that quadratic and form equation for our exponentials. It doesn't fall under case one, but it kind of doesn't fall under case two. It's somewhere in the middle. So let's see what we can do with this one. We know we can't get a single logarithm on each side, but maybe we can somehow combine the logarithms together into one logarithm. We know we had some rules that allowed us to do this. So one good option here is to get both logarithms on both side of the on one side of the equation. So I'm going to add the logarithm on the right hand side so that it moves over to the left hand side. So I have log base 2 of x plus log base 2 of x minus 2 is equal to 3. So now I have both logarithms on one side. They both have the same base and they're added together which means that we can apply the product rule for logarithms. The product rule states that if we have two logarithms added together, then we could combine them into one logarithm with multiplication on the inside. So these two added logarithms become a single logarithm with an input of x times x minus 2. Now we strictly fall under case 2 for our logarithmic equations. We have one logarithm on one side, it's isolated, and it's equal to a constant number. So now I can convert to exponential form. My base is 2, so the base of the logarithm becomes the base of the exponential, and then the other two numbers, or the other two expressions in our problem, switch places. 
So we now have, simplifying, log base 2, x squared minus 2x is equal to 3. Convert, we have 2 cubed is equal to x squared minus 2x. Now keep in mind, if you want, you can convert to exponential form before you distribute the x. It's really up to you which order you do it in. Okay, so now I have a quadratic. Keep in mind 2 cubed is just a constant number. We'll just simplify that down. But I do have an x squared. So I'm going to have to get everything on one side, and I'm going to have to factor. So if I get everything on one side, I have x squared minus 2x minus 8 is equal to 0. This factors as x plus 2 times x minus 4. And if I set each of these factors equal to 0, I get x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 4. So I need to check my two solutions. Let's check negative 2 first. We're plugging each of these solutions into two separate logarithms because our original equation had two logarithms. So if I plug in a negative 2, log base 2 of negative 2 is immediately undefined. So I don't have to check anything else. That means negative 2 is not a solution because we plug it back in and we get something that's undefined. Now let's check 4. Log base 2 of 4 is completely fine. We can take the logarithm of a positive number and it's defined. Log base 2 of 4 minus 2 is log base 2 of 2, which is also completely defined. So x equals 4 is a solution. It checks out in both of our logarithms. So we didn't see an example where this would occur, but keep in mind it's possible that we could solve algebraically, find more than one solution, and neither of our solutions worked. It's super important that you actually check all your solutions. You have to make sure that they give you all valid answers when you plug them back into your original equation. It's possible we could have one solution out of the two that work. It's possible that neither solution could, would work. So we have to verify that by checking our solutions each time. So to summarize, in this video we talked about solving exponential equations and solving logarithmic equations. Exponential equations typically fall under one of two cases. Our first case, which is our simplest case, is when we're able to write both sides in terms of the same base. If we can write both sides as an exponential in terms of the same base, then we can essentially just drop off the base, set our exponents equal, and solve for our variable. So that's case one. That's the optimal case. That's the simpler case. Case two is when we can't write everything in terms of the same base. In this situation, we apply the logarithm to both sides, making sure to have isolated the exponential, and then we use the power rule for logarithms to bring down our exponent. Remember, the exponent always contains the variable. The variable is what we're trying to solve for. So if we apply a logarithm to our exponential, the power rule allows us to bring our exponent and, consequently, our variable out of the exponent, and then we solve using standard algebraic rules. Logarithmic equations also fall under one of two cases. Our case number one is our basic case. When there's one logarithm with the same base on each side, just like with the exponentials, we can essentially drop off the base, which means dropping off the log in this case. So in that situation, we set our logarithmic inputs equal, and we solve for our variable. When we only have one logarithm, or we can't combine our logarithms into a single logarithm, we have to isolate the logarithm we have, and then we convert it to an exponential equation. Remember, the base of the logarithm becomes the base of the exponential, and then the other two expressions or numbers in the problem switch places. The only other thing we have to take into account is because the logarithmic situation, because our logarithmic functions have restricted domains, we have to make sure we check our solutions. We can't get any solution possible for a logarithmic equation. Exponential equations can get any type of solution. Logarithmic equations can only be solved by solutions that don't make our logarithms negative. So once we get our solutions to our logarithmic equation, we have to take them and plug them back into the original equation and make sure that we don't have any negatives inside of our logarithms. If one of our solutions makes a logarithm negative, that means that solution is undefined. It's not actually a solution to our problem.